I'd like to thank that really cool vendor who's going to add the first hardware switching driver upstream. You have no idea how cool you're going to be when you do that. You will be the trailblazer in the Linux networking stack. He loves hockey. He loves Tim Hortons. He loves Canada. That's why it was easy to bring him over here. Uh, there's other things you don't know about him. He's the IDE maintainer, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, I, was, I could read from his Wikipedia page. If anybody doesn't know Dave, or I could, I could go and read from his numerous quotes. I'll just go and cut and paste from uh, NetDev or from this conference. Uh, but I'm not going to embarrass you, Dave, so. Where's the script the 53 pack? Ah, I left it at home. Sorry about that. <laughs> so what I'm going to say is Dave has been a excellent custodian of the Linux networking stack. It's a very tough job, hard position to be in, but despite the different cons the hard constraints, he's done an excellent job. He tries to be fair. He, he's become very good at uh, diplomacy over the years. <laughs> right. uh, but his mind is in the right place. It's, a, it's all about getting a good networking stack, and the reason it's in the state it's in today is because of Dave. So let's please give him a round of applause. I would like to welcome him. I'd like to thank Jamal for not embarrassing me in the introduction. He had the opportunity to do so. I'm just going to remind him of that someday if he ever wanted to get me again. Um, so basically today I'm going to talk about the state of the Linux networking stack. So this is a selection of topics that I myself think are extremely important or extremely interesting to me. It's not if I leave something out, it doesn't mean it's not important or it's not interesting to me. I had to choose something. So we have a lot of components that have had serious uh, improvements recently. And we'll start with TCP. So you think after 20, 30 years of uh, protocol development, we kind of like figured everything out. But that's definitely not the case. It's very far from the case. And actually part of this is that the infrastructure over which we're running TCP is kind of changing all the time as well. So it is, it's kind of like a moving target. So one component of the improvements we've been making in TCP is uh, per flow pacing. Uh, it's worked by Eric Dumas and others at Google. And uh, this kind of ties in, a lot of these topics are related. So first of all, once we have per flow pacing and we kind of can know the pace, the sending rate of map application, we can make more intelligent decisions and elsewhere in the TCP stack. So that is what ties into the third entry dynamic TSO sizing. So if you're not familiar with TSO, what that's all about is if we've got five 1500 byte segments to send on the wire for TCP, we can send them into, as one big super packet to the networking card and it will split it up for us into the MTU size frames. Um, the problem with this is when you batch up stuff, you have to pick how much you want to send because there's, there's a trade-off involved. Uh, if you batch too much, you'll send a, a gigantic burst on the wire, and that trips up a lot of, uh, t of t TCP's algorithms, and the acts come back stretched, quote unquote stretched. Um, if you send too little, then you're not taking advantage of the offload as much as you can, so the, the benefit is minimalized. So dynamic TSO sizing makes the following compromise. It says, Based upon the measured sending rate as computed by the pacing and other aspects of the networking stack, don't make a TSO frame that would consume more than a millisecond on, on the wire. So that's, that's, that's basically the, the trade-off that dynamic TSO sizing is making right now. Um, fast open is really interesting. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing transactions, and that includes web requests and things like that, what you're interested in is minimizing the amount of round trips that occur to get the information that the user asks for. We lose two round trips by default just with the handshake to make the connection to the remote site, period. So what TCP Fast Open is about is getting the request out in the initial handshake uh, SYN packet and being able to send data back on the SYNAC. Uh, and that, that saves you two round trips, so that helps performance a lot in the, uh, in the request response type situations. Um, another development is in the area of congestion control, and this is uh, specifically data center TCP. This is done by Microsoft and some other people. Basically, the only notification we have that congestion is coming, it comes in a, a one-bit ECN field that's a Boolean, right? And data center TCP tries to extend that so that we can not only know 
we've got some congestion, but rather the extent of the congestion. So that's the, the long and short about data center TCP, and now we have support for that. Um, TCP small queues is an interesting feature, but I'm gonna talk extensively about that in the next slide because this is a, one part of a much larger problem. And we've also, ho hopefully we'll make some progress in the area of advanced TCP statistics. Uh, if you're at the Web10G uh, presentation yesterday, you'll understand what that's all about. So basically, there are a lot of things that people would like to know about how, ma how many times a certain, uh, a certain uh, event happens within the TCP stack to help them diagnose their applications, and we're trying to figure out a way to do that without well, minimizing overhead and making sure we put values in there that really make sense and are useful for people. So I'm looking forward to some uh, advancement in that area. So, like I said, I'll talk about TCP small queues here. Basically, we have the buffer bloat problem, and the, the, the issue is that buffer bloat exists at many levels of the networking stat and in the hierarchy of the networking protocols. Uh, so you can't just fix it in one place. It's not gonna work like that. So starting at the application, the, the TCP socket queues, they, they, there's a buffer blow problem there because TCP will queue up as much as it can to, to keep the pipe full, more than it needs to usually. So TCP small queues tries to minimize the amount of socket buffer space sent on the send side and will block the application until the, we're, we're back under the threshold. And now in the QDIS as well, Packets can sit there for a while until they're freed up and allowed to get to the device. And the device queues themselves can consume lots of uh, space. So a lot of these devices come up with 256 or more or 5, 12, or 10, 24 transmit queue entries. And there's a lot of time uh, that, that a packet will sit from the time it gets into the device driver to the point at which it hits the wire and the interrupt comes in to say that the packet is complete. This really matters for TCP because that, that interrupt completion interrupt is what signals that we can make more socket space available again. So this whole machine doesn't run until that whole queue gets run and that guy at the back can make it to the front and get on the wire. Um, QDIS is an interesting area. So if, if you consider the, the socket queues themselves and the QDIS, we're creating buffer bloat within the system itself at this point, which is kind of interesting. And the, a problem that this creates is that as on faster and uh, shorter latency networks, your TCP's timestamps start to be inaccurate because you're measuring the QDIS time, the time that the packet's sitting in the QDIS has nothing to do about the path between your link and the destination machine. So, you could, so by minimizing the size of these queues at the top and the middle end of the stack, our TCP timestamps are all of a sudden more accurate again. We'll have better R RTT estimates. Another area that we've been doing some really interesting work is checksumming. Um, Tom Herbert at Google has been doing a lot of work to uh, basically facilitate encapsulations. Uh, so VXLANs, and, and, and it seems like almost everything that's gonna be encapsulated in a data center will be something over UDP. So this is an important uh, case to look into. Um, basically, one thing you need to realize is that there's two sets of NICs out there. There's one set of NICs that says, I can specifically check some IP packets that are TCP or UDP, and I can specifically check some packets that are IPv6, uh, TCP or UDP. And frankly, that's not really interesting anymore. Um, what's interesting is a facility that could, that could handle any checksumming type that we'd want to do. And the only way to do that is a facility called Checksum Complete. Basically, what Checksum Complete is is that the card will basically compute the 16 bits two, two's complement checksum across the whole level two payload and give you that in the received descriptor. And with that, we can do lots of stuff. Uh, for example, when we receive a packet, we can say, okay, here is the checksum for the whole packet. packet. If we decapsulate the outer UDP frame and subtract the checksum from there to the UDP payload, we know what the checksum should have been for the, inner, for, for the uh, encapsulated IP packet, for example. Um, so that's really interesting. And Tom has worked on an internet draft for a facility called Remote Checksum Offload. And this provides a way to add metadata to the various encapsulation protocols that can tell the other end where the checksum in the inner part actually is located. So that facilitates uh, uh, doing two checksums at once. Uh, one implicit pro piece of this problem is that when the chips support checksum offload, they typically only support one level of offloading. So you can, you can tell it when transmitting, here's the place to put the checksum and here's the area that it covers. Uh, you can't say two locations and that's what you need for encapsulation 
uh, situations. But with the stuff that Tom is working on, we can, we can still uh, handle checksums of the inner packets as well. That's uh, a really powerful facility in my opinion. Um, because we haven't talked enough about switch offloading during the last couple of days, I'm going to make up for that gap in the next couple of slides. Uh, so I guess this is a really important development. It's something that it, it, you could argue we've been putting off for too long. Uh, so the main areas of focus right now and the, the areas where I see people doing apt, active work is in bridge forwarding, so the, the FDB, putting FDB in, onto the, the, sw the switch offload, doing route forwarding for IPv4 and IPv6, and uh, people are talking about doing uh, NF table rules in, in uh, offloaded into the hardware as well. We have some things to attend to. So let's, let's talk about a specific example. Let's say you go IP route add foo, right? So if we're offloading IPv4 forwarding into the hardware, what should we do if the route can't fit in the, in the hardware's tables? We've exceeded its capacity. And this is a really important issue because it delves into all the, uh, the uh, realms of the implementation that, will just, that, that are important for doing this kind of stuff. These aren't the only options. These are just three options I've discussed with various developers over the last couple of days and in the past. Don't install the route and return an error. Okay, so if we can't fit the route into the hardware's CAM table or whatever, we just don't install the route at all and we tell the user we couldn't do it, here's the error code. Okay. The next option is, if we exceed the capacity of the hardware, take everything out of the hardware and do all the forwarding in, so in software. That's another option. And the third option is to try to find some midway point where we put as much as we possibly can in the hardware and fall back to software for everything else. So option three is kind of interesting because it delves into all kinds of issues of you have to make sure you put more specific routes into the hardware offload because you have the, the, the issue of if you have two routes that overlap, one is, has a smaller prefix, one has a larger prefix, you can run into the situation where the, the, the switch would forward the less specific route, whereas you have a more specific one in, the hard, in software, but it wouldn't get checked at all since the hardware forwarded the packet already. Um, and so these are kind of like the, 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 the trade-offs that you have to consider. So here is my basic guideline. Whatever we do, it has to be 100% transparent to the user using facilities that we have right now. So if the, I, the user would have got the route installed and it would have properly forwarded all the packets. It should still do so after uh, we do hardware offloading. So this means that the returning an error when we exceed hardware capacity is kind of not, not an option in that particular example. Um, but two and three would be okay. Um, However, this does not preclude adding facilities for people who want to create specific configurations of sharing hardware and software or, uh, or would like to be, have the error code sent back on hardware capacity being exceeded, for example, or some other facility that would allow them to uh, control the situation, understand what the cap capabilities of the hardware are, learning exactly what kind of capacity miss happened, et cetera. So I'm not against that. I'm just saying that by default, when you use Linux tools, they should behave the way that they be behave in, with the software implementation. So in the realm of switch offloading, we have a lot of tracks of uh, uh, implementations going right now. So uh, we have specific offload operations for the device drivers for doing bridge offloading and IPv4 device uh, uh, route forwarding. And this is work by Scott Feldman and Jerry Pierco. Uh, basically, this is um, the line of thought that if we just tackle individual offloading problems, we can have a better idea about how these things interact with each other over time. Um, but eventually we're going to have to come to a point where we have to kind of encapsulate all these things because eventually we're going to have to deal with the fact that these, these things interact with each other. Uh, the table that holds the bridge FDB entries and IPv4 routes might be shared. There might be some way to uh, store more entries if we pack things a certain way or if we inserted them in a certain way. So we need some kind of like holistic model for this. But we're, we don't have enough experience with what these cards need or how these things are going to interact to do that yet. But meanwhile, in that vein, uh, the Flow API by John Fasteben is trying to uh, think about that angle of the problem. Uh, currently, he's proposed a set of API calls that allow you to get the, com uh, the com 
the configuration of the, hard, the hardware switch. Basically, it's the geography of the switch and what it's capable of. What kind of tables does it have? What kind of pipeline flows does it have? What can you do with, with the piece of hardware? So, and eventually, it'll have a set of operations to load flow entries, in a, uh, into, load rules into, into the hardware as well. And we can build things on top of that. So you could think in the future at some point, we've figured out what we need to do with bridge forwarding, IPv4 route device operations, and we implement them in terms of the flow API. That's one possible result. Uh, and if a third set of APIs comes along that thinks they can solve the, bottle, the problem better by being somewhere between these two extremes, that's okay too. That's part of the learning process. And right now it's, it's kind of a good time to be doing this because we don't have a lot of drivers. In fact, we have just one, the rocker switch driver. And so we don't have a lot of changes to do if we want to uh, adjust the APIs at this point. So it's a really good time for experimentation. Um, so like I said, we, we should be converging at some point, but that's, uh, that's, that's something in the future. So to me, all these technical issues are third, second place to what really matters, which is that we should really have a very clear story about why we're making certain trade-offs, and we should be able to clearly explain this to anyone who's unhappy with the, the, the design decisions we've made, uh, because Unlike the, pers the, the person who implements this or the person who, who uh, submits the code to me, I'm, I'm the one who's gonna have to answer to the person who's unhappy about how the APIs are. <laughs> um, so we really need to be very, very, we have to have a really good understanding about why we made this or that uh, trade-off. Uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is our hash tables. This isn't a networking specific thing. Uh, this is a generic uh, data structure facility. So the problem we have in the kernel is for high performance on SMP, uh, we use RCU locking, which basically allows readers to unrestricted, uh, unrestrictedly traverse a table even when updates are happening, new entries are being inserted, et cetera, et cetera. No locking at all, just a little bit of a couple of CPU memory barriers on either side of the operation. Um, one problem with this is uh, traditionally we haven't had a facility to change the size of the hash table, so we couldn't dynamically grow the hash table over time as uh, more and more entries are populated into the table. Our hash tables is a facility for doing this. It has a really clever algorithm for zipping and unzipping the hash chains as you grow by powers of two the hash table from one size to another, and it, therefore it allows dynamic sizing. Um, so. One manifestation of the RCU limitation for hash tables is that at boot time, we have a fixed size for the TCP hash table and it's, it's gigantic. We compute it based upon a percentage of the amount of physical memory in the system. So if you've got this gigantic machine and you really don't do a lot of networking on it, we're still chewing up megabytes of megabytes and megabytes of memory for the TCP hash table that's completely, mostly unused. So with ha if we convert TCP to use our hash tables, then we can dynamically size a table based upon actual usage instead of uh, just having to make the maximum reservation of memory at, at boot time. So it's a really, uh, really valuable facility in my, in my opinion. So right now we already have two users. The Netlink socket table and NF tables is hash table also use, uh, both use these facility, this facility. Uh, so that should really improve uh, set lookup performance for NF tables. Uh, so last August in Chicago, we had a networking subgroup in the kernel summit, and uh, we discussed several things. And I didn't, we didn't plan to talk about this, but uh, Rusty Russell pulled me aside and he said, hey, do you have any concept of how expensive it is to go into the hypervisor when I transmit packets over a virtualized networking device? And I said, no, but I can imagine how expensive it is. He's like, have you ever thought about batching and mitigating this cost? And I said, oh, we should look into that. So we had a discussion, and everyone seemed very interested in this, and uh, we went back and forth about how we would represent this in the drivers. I, I didn't want to change 500 transmit operation signatures in the, in, in, in the tree. I didn't want to edit 500 drivers to add this facility. So I tried to come up with some signaling mechanism that's outside having to change the argument set or the, or the semantics of the uh, transmit operation in the networking drivers. And what we came up with is a flag. It's in the, the socket buffer called xmit more. Basically what xmit, xmit more says, there's definitely another packet coming right after you return. So if you can defer any expensive operation to batch the processing of transmitting packets at this point, you should do so. So what a driver basically does is it'll queue the packet up in the transmit queue, 
And unless it's filled the queue and it has to get the card going anyways, it doesn't write the doorbell register that triggers the, the, the chip to start reading the new transmit queue entries. And in the case of the virtualization driver, it doesn't call into the hypervisor to tell it to tar start pulling packets off the transmit queue. Um, so once you've done this, you have to have a facility inside the kernel to start setting this bit. And that facility is bulk the queue support and the queue disk layers. So the queue disk layers now, the queue disk will have one or more packets sitting in, in its queue ready to go to the device. And since it has all this knowledge, that's where we set the, the transmit more bit. So there are some issues with this. Okay, so if you're in steady state on a local system transmitting over a, so a TCP socket and you've got the, the, the card going at line rate, yes, you will back up into the queue disk and we'll always have a bulk set of packets to, to send at once. However, when you're forwarding, receive is a little bit more expensive than transmit. So you may not be writing the, the transmit side at line rate and therefore you're not queuing up things to gather into, into, into the queue disk on the transmit side. So uh, there has to be some facility by which we can, we can make blobs at the front and then give them out in the back. What usually happens is we would do generic receive offload. This works for TCP flows that are uh, in packet trains. So as I explained earlier, a TCP send offload, uh, segmentation offload is we reverse the process on receive. We basically look at every packet that comes sequentially and if they have the same flow ID then we'll, and the same sequential sequence numbers, we'll gather them into a super packet and pass that through the stack. This has a lot of advantages. Uh, first, every single decision that has to get made in the stack to figure out where it goes, routing, policy, whatever, only gets to be done one, one time for n packets. So that's really powerful. Uh, and, but this doesn't happen, generally speaking, on a, a back-end router, a very, a very heavily used router. We have very, lots of unrelated flows, not a lot of packet gathering for TCP, so basically we don't get the batching of any, any type on the transmit side. So that's something we need to look into. Uh, Hannes was looking into some solutions and that we could do with that. We came up with some ideas the other day during NetConf. We'll see where that goes. But for the cases where this does trigger, it helps a lot. Uh, it can be the difference with the, our packet gen uh, transmit testing uh, facility of hitting line rate or not on uh, high speed networks. Another facility that I think is kind of interesting is, and I kind of have a, a background on this. Uh, one thing that drives me really crazy is uh, RDMA. Because, because it takes all, all of the nice things, and all the nice facilities, all the nice ways of doing things that we've created for people for flexibility out of the equation. You're really stuck with exactly what that card can do and that's it. Uh, you don't get net filter, you don't get traffic classification, you don't get the packet scheduler, you don't get p our pacing algorithms, you don't get uh, fair queuing, you don't get any of these facilities. And one of the main consumers of this technology seems to be financial institutions because they want the lowest latency possible to process small RPC packets. So one one thing I really like to see is alternative approaches to trying to solve this problem. I'm not saying that any one of these individual solutions leads us all the way to what our DMA can achieve, but it, I think it's a better solution because it doesn't bypass everything else that the Linux networking stack can do. And to me, busy polling is one instance of this, uh, this kind of problem solving. So basically, if you do a receive message and there's no packets in your queue, the process just goes to sleep and then you're done. And then you have the whole overhead of going to sleep and waking up again. This is expensive, especially if it's happening over and over again. What often happens is the, packet, the packet's there. We just have to process the interrupt, go through the software interrupt, pull the packets out of the queue during nappy polling, and then wake up to the process and he can, he can uh, do the receive. Why don't we just go directly into the device driver when this happens and do a receive message to pull the data out? And that's what uh, busy polling does. It has a facility for doing poll to the e-poll e call for event notifications too. Um, and this has one limitation. Uh, it doesn't handle well lots of connections using this facility. It's really good for one application that's doing RPCs at very low latencies and wants to, to get the packet as fast as possible. So. Uh, I want people to look into more solutions like this that get us right to the packets that we need as fast as possible in a device. Um, memory allocation batching. So this is kind of like uh, the culmination of the effort of uh, Jesper uh, Brewer. 
Uh, he's been looking to, to what we need to do to do wire, wire rate in various perspectives uh, under Linux. Uh, so, and uh, there have been other presentations. Uh, Alexander the other day gave a presentation on uh, what our packet budgets are, and Jesper kind of was playing with these numbers too. You have something like uh, less than 100 nanoseconds to process a packet at 10 gigabit when forwarding. So just one L2 cache access can be 12 nanoseconds. And so as you access more and more cache lines, you've already busted your budget. So memory latency is a huge issue. Another thing that Jesper noticed was that um, we really stress out the memory, the generic memory allocator in the kernel, uh, which is extremely general purpose. It's not meant, it's not uh, tweaked for specific workloads. It's meant to be a well-behaving allocator for everybody in the kernel. And sometimes what that uncovers is, is things like what we, what we saw here. So imagine that you have a full transmit queue and you've got a ton of receive packets coming in. Typically what happens is the transmit queue is perhaps some order of, uh, of magnitude uh, smaller than your receive queue, or the interval at which you've set the trans, uh, IRQ mitigation parameters is unbalanced between transmit and receive because you're trying to balance the, the higher cost of doing receive packets and the sh smaller cost of recycling transmit packets. So what can end up happening is you free up a small number of transmit frames uh, when you get you're done, and then you have you're refilling half of your receive ring uh, to replenish the empty entries, and that's a larger number, perhaps twice as many packets. This uneven allocation and freeing pattern is really bad for, for the, the slab and sub allocators in the kernel. Another thing is we typically, like I just mentioned, allocate a ton of these at once. We never allocate just one in the really expensive paths. So Jesper allocated a test framework. It was a, basically a, a networking-specific allocator called QMempool as an experiment just to see uh, what a different allocator facility would, would do. And he got extremely higher performance simply by adding batching facilities, uh, basically an interface where you could say, give me 64 buffers of this size from the allocator instead of just one at a time over and over again. Um, another thing about QMempool that was really cool is he used a lock-free Q data structure to pass these objects back and forth. So uh, there was, it, was, it was less expensive from an SMP perspective. Um, so Jesper presented these results and the, uh, got the attention of the slab and slub uh, maintainer. And he's uh, proposed recently a set of slab and slub extensions to allow batched allocation out of the slab allocator. And I hope that that, that moves forward uh, at some point in time in the future. I mean, that, that was really interesting work to me. Um, so this is one component of solving the, uh, the uh, forwarding overhead problem. Xmit more was kind of part of that too. That helps, that, that, that helps as well. So there's, there's lots of areas. Uh, Alexander uh, is working on uh, optimizing our FibTree data structure lookup. Um, the story with that is that we use something called LCTree, uh, which is a longer, longest matching prefix looking up, lookup algorithm. Um, the problem is it was directly translated from the researcher's code, which was in Java. And although he did a reasonable job, there's a lot of optimizations that were still possible. Uh, there are cases where Alexander found that we had, say, 10 lines of code twiddling bits and trying to look up prefixes, and you could deduce this to one logical bit operation on a single line of code. So you'd be surprised how many of those still exist in the, uh, in the networking tree. Um, I'm kind of done with the material I've, I've come up with. Uh, I could talk about some other things, or if anyone has any questions, I really would like to field those right now. Questions? So I don't know the whole history here, but we've been dealing um, in sort of the home router space with Samba. And one of the areas that you find in Samba is that transmit um, works pretty well because you've got a whole page and you actually, you know, can transmit out and you can make all the optimizations to never do any copying. Receive, of course, is scattered all over the place. What what that results in very often is a very disparate difference between read and write and Samba applications. What has been looked at where, you know, are there any thoughts or anyone working on trying to look at that problem in more detail? 
Okay, so one thing I'll mention about uh, the receive path is, especially over the last four or five years, I'd say that uh, we've been getting increasingly sophisticated receive buffering facilities in NIC cards. So what this means is, uh, instead of just having flat linear buffers, we're starting to use blocks of various sizes, and one of those block sizes is the page size. And if you can land the, the buffers directly in the page the way that they would want to be in the file system page cache or Samba's application buffers or what have you, we could start just getting things directly to user space and avoiding copies in op optimal scenarios. So that's one angle to kind of think about this, but you're definitely right. The, uh, the receive path could definitely be, always be more, more, more expensive, but I, I kind of want to encourage people to wrap their head around the receive problem from this following perspective. Everyone wants to do, eliminate the copies and not somehow avoid all the overhead of the receive side. But you have to understand that data isn't just this opaque thing we push here and there. People operate on this data. And then once they operate on that data, they write to the data. Therefore, they need to have a private copy of this data. So a lot of the benchmarks that just try to say how fast can you push things into user space, they miss the, the fact that you have to touch the data because that's what the application is going to do. The application is going to execute some kind of computation on that data afterwards. So that's another angle of this problem. So my answer is I'm hoping that NIC buffering facilities facilitate improving performance to a certain extent, but realize that there is a kind of like a wall up there because the CPU's speed kind of determines how fast we can process receive information to a certain extent. So I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Okay, uh, I'd like to thank some people. I'd like to thank Linus for giving us a playground to be in for the last couple decades. Without him, we wouldn't have this cool toy to play with every day. And I'd like to thank Jamal, of course, for running the conference. This, none of this would happen over the past couple of days without him. And in advance, I'd like to thank that really cool vendor who's going to add the first hardware switching driver upstream. You have no idea how cool you're going to be when you do that. You will be the trailblazer in the Linux networking stack. Ooh.